and here we are. How are you getting on, Kai? I'm good. How are you? Oh, I'm, I'm glad you're here. Um, I'm pretty sure it's pretty late where you are. Uh, it's not too bad. No, just in the evening. There you go. Um, for anyone who might not know you, how about you introduce yourself? Uh, I'm Kai Frano. Um, did you want me to tell you a little bit about what I do? Yeah, <laughs> sure. go on. Yeah. I was a stunt performer for 16 years. I've been an outdoor guide in the life before that. And then most recently doing extreme survival shows on television. Um, I am a traditional archer and I do try and bow hunt all my own food. All of it. Wow. <laughs> that, it's kinda, as much as I can. Kind of whack. Um, so, yeah, obviously that's not a thing over here, but we'll get into that later. So I, I guess we'll, we'll start with the stunt performing because you won an award for that and it wasn't an easy task. No, I mean, I um, when I first started dreaming about being a stunt performer, the, I had heard of the Taurus World Stunt Awards and they are what stunt performers have as an award system because we're not actually formally recognised in the Oscars because everyone wants to still pretend that we don't exist. Um, but we started our own awards show called the Taurus World Stunt Awards. It's voted on by our peers and I never would have even dreamed that one day I would be standing up on that stage accepting one of them. So it was bigger than big, shot my dream out of the water and it was a wonderful thing. What was your introduction to stunt performing? Because it, it, it sounds um, like something that's hard to get into. Yeah, absolutely. So I wasn't really aware of what stunt performing entailed when I decided to become a stunt performer and I just headed over to Vancouver and because uh, I heard there was a lot of movies being filmed there I was a little country girl didn't want to try and hit Hollywood I thought it would eat me alive so I just went to Vancouver and I looked around and everybody my height was gymnasts and Olympic level gymnasts so I knew that I wasn't going to crack stunts that way so I became a fighter spent three years training my butt off just learning all different martial arts and weapons and finally cut my break um, on what well, I had one stunt before that didn't have anything, anything to do with fighting. And then I got onto Andromeda, which was a spacey sort of show that had Kevin Sorbo, um, who used to be Hercules. So I used to watch that as a kid. It was pretty cool fighting Hercules. And then straight away got into Catwoman because Sharon Stone needed a kickboxing double. So that was sort of a real launch into an amazing career. That's not too bad, actually. That's that's, that's pretty good. And um, yeah. ha have you kind of stopped doing it and moved on to survival now, or what's going on there? Well, I mean, I was 16 years as a stunt performer. When I started, I was um, 28, which was pretty old for someone getting into stunts. And everyone told me I was too old to be a stunt performer. Um, and I wanted to really retire at 40. You know, our bodies are just not meant for that high level of impact. A lot of people over 40 have like fused vertebrae in their necks and just permanent damage. But I was still doing some of the best fighting in my career at 42. Um, so I was sort of reluctant to give it up. Um, and then my hamstring fell off, had to be screwed back onto my butt. And I decided maybe that was a good time to move on. <laughs> how, how did that happen? Um, you know, I basically fought it off. So I was running across a rooftop um, on one of the scenes on a TV show called Blind Spot, and it started to tear. And I don't know, the doctor was like, wow, well, you know, can you keep working? And I was like, sure, sure, I can try. And I just kept working. And over the next sort of five months, it just sort of fell off. That's uh, <laughs> not a fan of that happening anyway. Yeah, that, that's something that's not. Yeah. Sorry to hear that. You know, I honestly, I just thought, you know, they just screw it back on again and you get on with life. But it turns out it's a bit more serious than that. And it, uh, it was about three months in a wheelchair and uh, all those sort of things. But I mean, I'm 100% now, so I'm not too worried about it. So uh, I'm glad to hear. But yeah, like muscle falling off the bone doesn't sound very nice ever. Unless maybe you're at a barbecue. Um, yeah. That's different. <laughs> with some really good pulled pork or something. There you go. Um, and then, yeah, like, so you, you, you were a vegetarian for, for what, 20 years? Yeah. So, um, doctors felt like I had some genetic disease, disease called hemochromatosis, where you take too much iron out of food 
and they recommended that I either donate blood every week or I become vegetarian. And so I chose being vegetarian. It was way easier. And um, eventually I just became so sick, even though I tried to do it properly with the proper nutrition and stuff. Um, I found that my body wasn't repairing itself properly. Um, I was fatigued. I did my first Naked and Afraid as a vegetarian and it took me about three years to recover from it. I did my final Naked and Afraid six years later <laughs> as a carnivore and I started training the day after I got out of that one. So for me, my body just responds way better to being full carnivore and eating nothing but meat. So it, that, that that's your whole, whole thing, just meat? Yeah. Like you wouldn't even have like... Like sweets or anything? No, I have eggs. Like I have it's, it's <laughs> meat and animal products, but I don't have a sweet tooth. Like I never have, so it's not a big deal to me. I actually just really love a good steak. <laughs> I, I I really admire people who can do stuff like that because my my problem is a sweet tooth. I'd be like, oh, I love a donut, like, but I also love a steak. I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but um, yeah, like, so you're you're a bow hunter, um. And now you're, you're um, you're hunting for most of your food like that. Um. So what, what kind of stuff are you catching? Because like, you you're in Australia. I, I don't know like what what you, you're allowed hunt. Um. Yeah. So we have a huge uh, feral animal population. Um. So the deer are feral here. Um. Goats, pigs, rabbits. Um. Anything that's not a native Australian animal doesn't even have a season we can hunt it sort of anytime we want and that was the thing for me you know like I don't mind eating me I just really wanted to try and do it in the most sustainable way possible and I thought if I was going to eat me I should be responsible for um for getting it yeah it's a really nice way to look at it cause... common misconception is like that hunters are, are cruel but like in reality like there's some of the most ethical you know people out there because you know you might get one deer how long does that last you yeah and also like i i practiced for a year with my bow before i went out hunting you know and i practice almost every day i can i've always got a target i'm carrying around in the back of the car um if i'm traveling on my motorbike i have a little bunny rabbit that target that i strap to the back because my bow is on the bike as well you know so i'm always practicing to make sure that when I'm in the position to make a kill, it's the quickest, most ethical kill I can make. Yeah, yeah. That, well, that, that, that's one thing you kind of have to do um, with, with bow hunting, because you don't want to be that asshole who who misses, and you like you get it in the leg, you get it in the ass, and now you have to track yeah. it down and you know catch this this poor frightened thing. Like, yeah, I, I wasn't aware of those deer in Australia. Uh, how, how oh yeah, we've got. Ah, uh, you know. Everyone liked a slice of home, so they brought the deer over, much like the rabbits and the foxes and everything. So we had massive deer farms, and then they've just escaped from deer farms. So we have rooster, fallow, reds, um, samba. We have chittle. You name it, they're pretty much all over Australia. We also have camels. You can hunt camels here with a bow. Like it's crazy, feral camels. So uh, that's unique. So <laughs> anything that isn't a native animal, you can you can go out and hunt. Yeah. Like, do you need, do you need a license? Like, well, what's the story there? Because uh, that's so alien here. Because there's no hunting here unless you're basically an aristocrat. Yeah, you need a hunting license for the state, but um, and you need for the bigger deer in certain states, you need a bow of a certain poundage. Um, so. Most of the time I shoot 35, I'm working up to 45, but in some states you can't shoot like a samba or a red with a 35 pound bow, which I think is ridiculous because if you get the right place for the heart and double lung shot, you know, it's the same on, you know, Fred Bear killed an elephant with a 50 pound bow, you know, I mean, you're looking at um, just getting that soft spot and I don't think, if I'm close enough, my bear bow just packs enough of a punch to get through those type of animals anyway. But yeah. that's the rules. I mean, well, I think there's, there's two extremes. Like, like I, I shoot 38 pounds. That could take on pretty much anything, to be honest. Like, like what you're saying. 
but then like you have the likes of Cameron Haynes out there shooting eighty pound compounds. <clears throat> like the Isn't power he behind that. He's up to hundred. I thought he got up to hundred now. Yeah, he's got this new one that I think's a hundred. Like, I, I don't know how that kind of like sounds like your shoulders are gonna just explode at some point. He's gonna be getting the full draw, and everything's gonna tear one day. Right. Well, I think it it's a new design that has a bunch of cogs in it that really takes the pressure off pulling the hundred pounds. Mm. But um, still, I mean, what do you need that for? Yeah, Obviously, who needs trading wheels? Punch. That's just punching holes through things. <laughs> yeah. 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 I love that in the archery community that like the compounds end up being called like training wheels or whatever. They kind of yeah. get like shunned by everyone else. And you're shooting a, a traditional bow, right? Yeah. 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 And that's, uh, that's, that's something I think we talked about the other day that, you know, with wool hunting, when you have the, um, the compound, you can kind of be at that at full draw for a while. You just kind of chill with it. But then, like, yeah. and you, you press a button and bang, you got a sight and everything. Yeah. But what you're shooting, you're kind of stuck there. Like, you're starting to get a bit of shake, and you know, you, you could you could mess up a shot like that. It, yeah. There's a bit more skill to it. I mean, I like it because it, you know, when I made the decision to hunt, I picked up a few types of bows, and like, I'm a pretty, I like simple things. You know, like, and the less moving parts something has, the less likely that something goes wrong with it. You know, like, my string's not going to be jumping off its off its cogs anytime soon, you know, and it's just, for me, like, I don't, you know, my rooftop tent's on top of my car, not towed behind on a trailer, because I feel like you put a trailer, you've got more moving parts that can start to go wrong. I like much prefer a straight knife rather than a flip knife because you've got once you've got the flip, you've got stuff, you know. So I feel the same way with my bow. Like it's just it's simple. I know how to use it and nothing can really go wrong with it apart from like the string might break, but I've always had a spare. So I kind of, you know, feel more comfortable with less moving parts at the end of the day. Yeah. Uh, do you reckon that comes out of like survival? Maybe, yeah, definitely. The less things you have things can go wrong with then the more likely you are i think to survive mm. yeah that, that, that's that's definitely it but yeah i like that approach kind of like minimalist like you just want it to work not, not look fancy yeah yeah absolutely yeah although i do have really nice red pom-poms on it so it does kind of look fancy still too no, well i guess they, they are functional they are yeah uh, i used to, I, when i started archery i started off with, with a like a trad recurve then got like a proper trad and i eventually moved back to uh recurve again but you know sometimes i look at the old bow thinking today's the day i might pick it back up but uh i have to get get back to it someday like, it's, yeah. it's such an amazing style of archery because I, I i'm a very bearbow shooter so i, I string walk like i, I just kind of right. like figure out you know might be 20 yards duh, 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 bang you're just kind of yeah. like oh it's over there bonk yeah 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 i love i love, I love insti instinctive shooting but uh i wasn't very good at it right well see i can shoot it bullseyes till the cows come home and i'll get like blah, 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 just like you know maybe that but you put a real animal in front of me and it's like poof, heart, poof, heart. you know like i'm i i like i guess the opposite of that target panic because yeah. i actually shoot better when like I'm, I'm calmer and the arrow goes better when I've got the animal in front of me. It's a strange thing. Yeah, I, I, I don't know what that is now. I suppose people have the opposite, right? Yeah. Like, you, so, like you're an expert on the uh, on the target, but then you get to the thing, you, you wouldn't know what to do. Yeah, I don't know. So, I mean, if I'm making my own targets, I have to draw an animal torso rather than a rather than the bullseye because I just I put like a little heart there and a little heart and lungs and then I can just get it every time I don't know it's just visualization for me it works and do you, are, are you like gap shooting or are you instinctive instinctive what, what, what do you what do you think that there is to that because you know I, I've had people say to me before that <coughs> they, they reckon it's because we've had bows so many different so, so long in our history that there's something to it in like the, the human mind but I, I don't really know what 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 do you what do you think it works so well? Um, it could be that. I mean, I I honestly don't know. I've tried to explain it in my own mind. Like every time I pick up any type of weapon, it feels very natural to me. 
Um, so from swords to sticks to long staff, I don't know. I've always picked it up and felt like I've done it before. And I do feel the same way with the recurve bow, which is sort of so maybe it's like the epigenetics of it all, you know, like it's been in our genes for so long, it just does come, but I don't know. I, I can't explain it. I just maybe think it's something that you either just feel perfectly comfortable with it or you don't. I mean, I felt the same way when I killed my first animal. Like I, I've, I've never felt just the rightness of a way of lifestyle with that. I mean, and I don't mean just went out and killed an animal, but when I killed my first goat for meat, it was just like, wow, this is, this is what we should be doing. This is the way we should be living. This is how we should be getting our meat, you know, like I never really experienced that. Oh my God, what have I done? It's just like, no, that's, that's what we should be doing. Yeah. Cause I guess most people never try hunting, but people mm. who do where it's almost like a spiritual thing. Um, mm. I, I still haven't tried it. I've been archer for fucking six years. Well, it's five if you exclude 2020. <laughs> but, yeah, um, we all do. <laughs> yeah, we, we all dropped that one. But yeah, like uh, I'll get to it eventually, but I don't even think I'm good enough to do it. Um, it's it, it just the, the pressure, like the, the you don't feel apparently of if I miss, oh God. Yeah. You know, I think it comes down to years of stunts as well. Um, I'm just like, I'm just used to operating under pressure. You know, when you've got a full crew of people and millions of dollars riding on one shot and you have to put your foot in the right place at the right time to make a stunt work and you do that for 16 years, you just feel like you feel at peace with the the process of being under pressure. Um, and I mean, I joke with my partner because, you know, we can be out messing around. He like bow hunts as well. We can be out messing around on targets or like we throw knives and we'll be throwing knives at targets. And I'm like missing, missing, missing. And he'll be like, all right, we'll bet the dishes on this. And I'm like, bullseye, 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 bullseye. <laughs> so it's just like, <laughs> A little bit of pressure, and I'm like, yeah, I'm ace. <laughs> yeah, I'd almost imagine you're pretending at that point. Just, just kind of like I'd start, oh, I can't get it. Bet the dishes. <laughs> Boom. Boink. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Every time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. I mean, that, that's a fun way to be about it because you, you're not based in one area. Like, you're kind of like a nomad, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, in these COVID times, like I was living in on and off in the US, back here in Australia and back in the US, just doing some different things, especially the survival show stuff. And then, um, yeah, COVID struck. So then I came back to Australia, but I didn't have a base here, but I've always had a rooftop tent. So just on my car and wherever the adventure calls. And um, my cousin has a 38,000 acre property in um, the mid north of South Australia. And I knew he had feral goats. So I was like, great, could live there as long as we like. And so, um, you know, and he has a, a license to cull kangaroos as a farmer. So he'll shoot some roos and I, you know, collect that meat, get a bit of kangaroo meat, a bit of goat meat and just, you know, live off that works. I remember they used to do kangaroo steaks over here, like mm. in supermarkets, but I was never yeah. brave enough to try it. Um, <laughs> Mm, it's not too bad it's an acquired taste um you know I don't mind it I like it in the mince it's one of the lowest cholesterol meats that you can get it just it it's unmistakably something different that you then become you know you know it's unmistakably kangaroo <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is I think it's just kangaroos almost look okay in, in, in comparison to other animals they look a lot more human like they stand upright they like flex their muscles <laughs> and uh, they really have like grasping hands as well so i don't yeah, know how yeah. i feel about that it's like would you eat a monkey uh maybe oh not. no i wouldn't eat a monkey but well i mean if i was hungry enough i'd eat anything that was my <laughs> basic rule of thumb <laughs> oh, sure. but, but um you know when you've been out and you've lived through kangaroo plagues and you see the damage they do and you know that um, the amount of kangaroos out there is not good for the land and it's not good for them. You know, they end up dying of starvation too. 
and you start seeing them like mice you know they're just they're everywhere and they're in plague proportions they need to be culled and sort of yeah yeah it's like anything i guess you get used to it so i guess for people who wouldn't know much about like the how ecosystems work there, there's no like big predators in in um, australia so no the, the populations yeah. go out of control like Yes, we, um, you know, we have the dingoes, but they're even a recent introduction to Australia. They only came across a land bridge about 6,000 years ago. So prior to that, um, I mean, without getting into the dinosaur age, we really didn't have a lot of big predators, um, which is why the foxes were so detrimental. A lot of our birds are ground nesting birds because they didn't need to put their nest in trees. And a lot of our little marsupials, um, don't have any defenses so between cats and foxes they've wiped out probably half of our native nocturnal animals mm. Jesus. yeah it, it's a rough one but even like when humans came over to australia like like we do everywhere we go we kind of wiped out the local predators like you know mega megalania or the, the thylacine so yeah after that it's just kind of i guess us <laughs> and, right yeah but um, I suppose that's kind of a problem in Australia because most people live in like certain areas, like built up areas, so no one's in the outback. Um, there are there are people in the outback, but yeah, most of the um most of the populations around the coast just due to water issues. But we do have quite a few permanent water sources. As far as the, we have a big river that runs through the Murray Darling. Um, there's a lot of settlements sort of along the river there, but yeah, most of our people live on the coast, but um. I mean, there, we shouldn't be farming a lot of them. We, you know, farmers do exist out there, but, you know, they have to have one, ca one cow per one square kilometre in order for the cows to survive. And you just think about paddocks. So like, you guys are in Ireland, right? Yeah. Yeah, like your paddocks there, I went there just recently and you've got like 50 cows in a little paddock and they're all happily munching on the grass and that that's existence for them but you know in australia we just have to spread our, our cattle and sheep way mm -hmm. further out than that i love your country by the way it's just beautiful thank you yeah, yeah. it's nice looking yeah. but it's shitly run <laughs> i can do better <laughs> management i'll tell you that but yeah like i suppose the way we have cows here is probably not to blow our own horn like it's some of the best in the world yeah um, like it's, it's almost like a perfect environment for it like the, yeah. gr the grass just grows like nothing else. It, yeah. it just grows so fast. And like, it, it, this is so much of it like, and then that just work, works in favor. And the, so the soil yeah. so good as well. Like, um, obviously why we're so agriculturally based. Um, yeah. And yeah. your milks and creams and cheeses are delicious. <laughs> yeah. Actually, nice. that's one thing that I've, I've found like <laughs> going to other countries. If I go to France, I have some milk. I'm like, what the fuck is this? <laughs> yeah. I, I've been to Germany as well. I, I've been to a fair few bits of Europe. I think Austria was the only bit that was like, okay, this is normal. Yeah. Whereas <laughs> I go to your place and I'm like, what the fuck is this? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Just yeah. drinking it out of the jug. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I, oh, that's, that's a terrible sight. People come to Ireland just to like down gallons of milk. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I came there also to like fly, like go through one of your forests with one of those hawks on my arm. So, you know, the milk and that. <laughs> that sounds kind of cool. Um, yeah, there's not a lot of wild left in Ireland um, in comparison to where you are. Mm -hmm. I don't think there's anywhere wild left. Like, I think we have like one national park being like restored right now. Do you know about that one, Thomas? Like it's in Limerick? Uh, I, I, I don't, to be honest with you. Okay. But yeah. uh, there's only basically one. Because you know we've kind of done the place up, or the previous occupants done it up as well. Um, yeah. So it's it's kind of weird to watch like the likes of Les Stroud or, or yourself, and see like there's that you can go to these wild places because you, you won't we won't won't find them here. So what, what was your no, introduction to survival? Um. Well, I mean, I basically was an outdoor guide before I was a stunt performer um but that was like going out with tents and um you know with kit and then once i'd been in the stunt industry for a while i thought i would start trying to go out with nothing and so i hiked across the sierra nevadas it was 100 miles 
took us 10 days. I did it with another fellow survival dude and we just took a pocket knife and some camera gear and I almost died of starvation. I decided I needed to learn a lot more and <laughs> that was sort of my beginning of like, right, well, I never want to be in that situation again where I'm relying on someone else's skills to get me through um, with the gaps in my knowledge. And so I just went out and started to get as much knowledge about it as I could and I love it like I'm passionate about being outdoors it's where I feel happiest when I'm in the middle of nowhere with no one for miles I'm you know that's what I love yeah Mr. Loves COVID I mean <laughs> I did I did <laughs> you know like now nobody can I... come near me it's great <laughs> i know I, all those memes that are like you know after covid can you still stay away from me i was like yeah that's probably <laughs> I, I i seen one well, i'm not sure which way your shows it was from but i seen you have like this is one quote and it was what the average person can survive for blank amount of days without food but it gets to most people after one and like uh, that's that's pretty 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 true when you're out, out and out and about and in survival situations because you're fucking you're panicked over everything and then like i i, I don't know what we were saying beforehand like the average person does so poorly in survival situations because you know we we have like three meals a day in, in survival mm. you might have one every two days if you're lucky i mean the thing is to know what your priorities are and not worry about the things you can't change you know, so like in my Naked and Afraid I did alone in the Amazon, I mean, I I wasn't getting any food a lot of the days. But if you focus on it, then it becomes all consuming. Whereas if you just focus on the things you can change, like I could fix my shelter, I could make some more traps, I could try and build a fish trap. I could like, you know, if, if I, you know, I had to chop so much wood every day just to get me through the cold night. So I feel like the problem is we all focus on the things that we can't change and that aren't a priority. And that's when we start sort of getting into the head game of it all. Yeah. But, Thomas, you were saying beforehand, like it's such a weird concept, naked and afraid. Like why, why, I don't know why, why did I send you out there naked? Like that sounds like you could have a lot of problems. Right. Well, that is the thing is they wanted to make the most extreme survival show they could. And I was in the first season, so nobody had done it before and they, nobody had even heard of the concept. And when they came to me and said, look, Kai, Hey, we want you to do this survival show. It's called naked and afraid. I said, no, I was like, mm. and they were like, it's going to be pixelated. Nobody's going to see anything. And I was like, yeah, but still no. And then they said, look, this is like, the most extreme situation you could ever be put in don't you want to test whether or not you have what it takes to survive in the most extreme scenario and I was like yeah no I do and and it does make a difference you know like that this is your first layer of shelter it's such a huge protective thing both mentally and physically that once you've got that stripped away then it really it really just does add so much more to the whole challenge and to be honest if someone held up a pair of underwear or a pair of shoes I would have taken the shoes you know like at the end of the day it, it just becomes about what's really important and protecting your feet at all costs is important having your butt out for the world to not see because it's pixelated is like just just not going to be an issue I think my, my concern would have been like you know creepy crawlies uh, yeah. uh, you know especially yeah. at night like yeah how would you how would you fall asleep you just get used to it. Like in the Amazon, if there wasn't something crawling on me, I was like, what is wrong? You know, and I had a, I had a like five second policy. If you crawled on me for five seconds and you haven't bitten me, you can stay. But if you crawl on me and you bite me, you're done. Like <laughs> we're, we're done here. Yeah. But then you have to know things like um, the ants. If you squash them, they release a pheromone that calls all their other brothers and sisters to come and like get their body. So, you know, like even if you've got stuff on you, if like people squash it, then a million more come. So you've got to just know <laughs> you got to be okay and almost in a symbiosis with everything that's going on around you. Yeah, that's that's, that's real mental. And that sounds horrible. <laughs> yeah. Have a that shit sounds crawl on you when you're going to sleep, like, oh, you haven't bitten me. Sound. All right. Night, yeah. night, night, night there, little yeah. snail. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, you know, like, <laughs> you're, you're, pet, you're petting your favorite cockroach. Good night. 
Because it didn't yeah. bite you, yes. Yeah, I mean, the worst was I rolled over on a bullet ant in my sleep and oh. a bullet ant is like, feels basically like you get shot and then someone's like punches you in the wound. So it's like the most painful ant bite you could ever have. That was not a fun. And I was just like, Duh! you just wake up a bolt from nice. trying to be part of sleep. But, you know, I mean, in the Bahamas, it was like scorpions would bite you all night and it was just, you just get used to it. And as you think, well, you know, as long as it's not one of those ones that means I have to leave the competition or, you know, it's too fatal, we'll just get on with what we can deal with. You know what? I'm never going to complain about a bad night's sleep anymore. Because I know if I'm in my fucking bed that it's it's better than being bitten by scorpions and bullet ants, you know? Jesus Christ. Yeah. It just makes you appreciate <laughs> the simple things. <laughs> it, it really does, you know? <laughs> That's just crazy. Like, I'm... I'm mental and you're so chill about it as well i'm like oh yeah it's just the scorpions bro <laughs> yeah, the don't scorpions, worry about it <laughs> but it was one of the bad ones like so it was fine yeah well i mean i had a moment in my last challenge in the amazon where um there was only one little exit out of the jungle i'd built a raft that really barely floated because there wasn't any really floaty wood around so I was going to be part submerged in the water and I could only get from the jungle out into the open water through one little passage. And I'm sitting there doing a diary cam and I see something move past the diary cam and I'm like, that's a fucking caiman. <laughs> it's like one of the biggest species of alligator in the world. And it's just like come into this area and then <clears throat> submerged. So I know that that caiman is now in my exit but i have to go that way i was like can't complete the challenge so i mean when you're looking at losing a limb as you paddle over where you last saw a caiman or or an ant bite you're just like yeah you do like the ant bites they're fine <laughs> that's terrifying <laughs> especially because like in comparison to other animals like we're squishy like i'm squishy as fuck <laughs> you know you go to, a, to an alligator like you you can't you can't do anything to that except annoy us. I mean, poke it in the eye. You just you just at that stage. I just wanted to get out of there. I was like, "All right, we're doing this. All right, we're doing this." <laughs> just... That's that's crazy. <laughs> and yeah, like it it sounds mental when they they approach you for it. Like, okay, so it's like a survival show. You're out out flank, blah, 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 but you're naked as well. Like I'm sure they said that part really fast. Yeah, well, yeah. That's, it's called naked approach. <laughs> it's yeah. just like, hmm. And was the Amazon your, your first one? The last one. <clears throat> All right. And which one did you go into as, as a vegetarian? Louisiana swamps. And were you still a vegetarian for the whole, whole way through it? No, like, I mean, I'm a practical human being, and they put us in an area where there was no edible vegetation. So, I'm just gonna do what so I need did that to do. On purpose. To fight. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I was like, I was like, I'm vegetarian. Oh my gosh, look, there's that little bit of fish. <laughs> just... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we killed a little rodent thing. It's called a nutria. It's a mix between a beaver and a rat. And uh, you know, sometimes you get a strange edit on these shows, but the sound of it dying was a bit much for me at that stage and I was a bit overwhelmed it was like day 18 we hadn't eaten much and I'm having a bit of a like I'm, I'm actually like look we need to kill it faster than that so I've got tears in my eyes and I'm trying to kill the thing faster but in the edit it looks like I'm crying because we're killing it but it's just the most hilarious thing because it's like I'm like oh, nutria and then I'm like oh, that's delicious <laughs> 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 yeah. This is so. so <laughs> yeah. God damn. So um, sad. Do, when you're doing those shows, do you have like crew members with you, like to film you, or is it just kind of yourself and a camera? Um, different for different <laughs> shows, but for Naked and Afraid, they usually are there for like eight or nine hours during the day, and then you self film at night. So you have a small crew, just one cameraman and one sound. Um, the last one I did was called Alone. So they actually left me alone way more than that. So it was more like six hours with one camera lady who did both camera and sound. And then the rest of the time I was on my own. 
So yeah. I always wondered how they worked. Like, would they have to do it with you? I was, I was like watching the show, like, fucking hell, the crew are as brave as these people, you know? The like... crew are amazing. Yeah, <laughs> like on the insertion and like the first and last day, they're, they're in there with you and they are, you know, trudging through it all. And, um, you know, they are amazing. They're doing it with a, a camera on and, uh, but they do get to go home to their hotel at night to sleep and they do, <laughs> you know, they put the infrared cameras around the camp and then they head off and get a good night's sleep and a shower and some food. Yeah. Pretty sure that that's, that's why people, like, stopped liking Bear Grylls because, like, you just, you did it and you went home. But then, like, yeah. in fairness, I can live with him doing that. I was like, I think someone's sitting there on the couch, fucking all flobby, bits of like grease on their shirt, eating a pizza. He's not even doing it right. <laughs> when he's drinking his own pee, oh my god, he went home to the hotel and had a wine afterwards. I'm like, yeah, but he still drank his own pee. Like, let's get into that. <laughs> yeah, I, th- I think Les Les Stroud said something like that. That was like a terrible idea. So like, he showed yeah, what they actual did. actually do. Yeah, never do it. Like everyone always is like, drink your own pee. And I'm like, okay, that's waste product. And that's going to shut your kidneys down faster than if you don't drink at all, you know? Yeah. So it's not, it's it's hastening you towards death. Unless you're drinking your own pee when you're really super hydrated, but then you're super hydrated because you've been drinking water. So then why would you be drinking your own pee? Other mm. than that, it's not a good idea. Yeah. I think the way he showed her, he had like a bin bag or something and he like peed in like a hole, put like plastic <coughs> over it and it would evaporate back up like the, the as mostly water. That, that's what right. I, the Stroud showed. But again, yeah. I'll touch that one. <laughs> I'll touch that one pretty hard. Yeah. Yeah, uh, Thomas writing that down. <laughs> I don't think own I, no. I like taking like uh, pieces of advices from, you know, the podcast we do and yeah. I usually like to take down one point in today's is don't drink your own piss. Same. Yeah. Yeah. I probably don't even need to write that down though. <laughs> well, I'm, surprised. I, I, I'm a bit of a weird guy. No, I'm <laughs> <laughs> Just paste it up on the mirror so you never forget. Yeah. You're not supposed to do that. <laughs> yeah. um. Hang on a minute. <laughs> Wait. Uh-oh. <laughs> ah. Yeah. That's so, that's just, yeah. Um, how how did survival even like start as like a TV genre, like it it's kind of like a staple now of like basically Discovery Channel, but yeah. like, is is it new? No, I mean we had the Bush Tucker Man in Australia way long ago, and then um, you know he was out. He wasn't doing survival survival, but he was definitely looking at the way the indigenous sort of moved through the land in Australia. But I mean Bear Grylls was certainly the very first person to bring it out into the mainstream and I remember he was pitching his show around and everyone was like yeah no one's interested in survival and then it really hasn't stopped you know I think um there's always a fascination with watching other people suffer um and watching them go through trials and tribulations while we're sitting in the comfort of our own home but I also feel like um there's a fear-based thing that's very big in probably more America than anywhere else where there's the preppers and you know, people are worried that they're going to need to use this information in the future. There's um, fear and uncertainty, probably more in those countries than anything else. But um, people feel like they're learning useful bits of information that they're going to take with them in the future, just in case their worst happens. But, you know, and there's a, I feel like, I always say the difference between someone who likes Naked and Afraid and someone who doesn't is the person who doesn't, hasn't watched it. You know, like there is this really interesting um, vibe of watching people defy the odds and achieve more than they ever thought they could in really um, extreme circumstances. So it's, you know, it's it's a human drama as well. Yeah. You're kind of right with that thing of, you know, we like to see people suffer. Like that, that's probably why like true crime is such a big thing. Yeah. Like it's gigantic. Especially in the, yeah. in the podcast world, like, you know, most podcasts we see is true are true crime, right? Is, it's crazy. Yeah. I can't watch it because I like yeah, being so. outside alone. So it's like anything that makes me nervous about that. I'm like, nah, I'll avoid that. <laughs> Have you ever had some like spooky experiences out there? 
not human based ones no and not really not really animal based either i've been pretty fortunate i mean i don't so not human not animal so plant-based <laughs> yeah <laughs> I've had some strange oh, big foot freaky looking well, eucalyptus out there. You know, I had some weird experiences in the Amazon, but that was probably more on a spook level than a than a um yeah, like than a a physical level, but nothing really. I mean we've had alligators. I had a jaguar around the camp in the Amazon. Um I don't get spooked easy, I think it's probably the bottom line. And that must be like a sharp contrast to like when you bring people out to, to do survival stuff. Because I know you've done a show before where you brought three three ladies out to um to do I forget what it was called. Um, um yeah. I did a thing. I was three ladies. I did a thing with one girl. Um, I there might have been a show promo where I was out with three girls. We were shooting shooting something. Yeah. And they weren't very comfortable out there. No, most people are very scared of what they don't know. And the outdoors is grand for a huge amount of things that people don't know. Yeah, because, you know, we, we sit at home, we're on our iPhones, we're making podcasts, and uh, we don't really get to go out and do it. But uh, I suppose it's good to go outside, especially at the moment. Especially if you've been cooped most up all the, all the time. Mm. Yeah. Are you um Are you familiar with, like, I'm a celebrity. You probably are. Like the TV show that puts like celebrities into the wild. Yeah, I don't really know how wild it is out there for them. But yeah, oh, I mean. They did it in compared Wales. to what you do, it's it would be like me sleeping in my bed. You know? Like... <laughs> <laughs> See, they do get beds. <laughs> they get, they get um, hammocks. They get those. Or even I think one of them get. I think if they're old enough, they get beds. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's so. um, luxury. I was gonna say you should try you should apply for it and then you know when they say here's your bed you just kind of coop up on the ground there you know <laughs> but <laughs> no, you put them all see, shape I... on a bed of rocks <laughs> <laughs> see when i could get luxury i take it you know like uh people often you know if, i mean i love a long bath and i like getting my toes and fingernails done you know i like um wearing high heels and dresses on red carpets you know i do like the i'm like if i'm gonna glam it you know like i love that just as much as you know, i could sleep on a wet log in the middle of the swamp as well so um survival's about making the most of the best of the situation so if i had a bed i'd be taking a bed fair yeah fair. <laughs> i don't think anyone would voluntarily <laughs> sleep on the ground um yeah, and I'd love to see you do a show like that and just just dominate, like, because you know you get like get celebrities in there who like haven't really a clue what's going on, and then you know you put put someone who actually knows what they're doing in there, it's all right. But um, a lot of their stuff isn't it's not survival at all. Like it's it's no. challenges like it's not. put your hand in this thing of <laughs> of snakes. None of them are venomous, but grab what's in the box. I'm pretty sure you'd just be like, yeah. just 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 in out grab done. I think that's why they wouldn't want me on shows like that. I think um, and there's not as much fun if you don't really care. Yeah. Yeah. Spoil the sport. <laughs> um, <Yeah. laughs> do, you, do you have anything else coming up um, in terms of like survival shows? Because I know, I know you've outbacked lockdown recently. Yeah. So that myself and my partner, when COVID hit, we went to a stone cottage that had no running water and no electricity. It was a single room stone cottage. And we lived off the grid and off, off the land obviously using our bows um no wi-fi and just the show sort of came out and captured um moments when we were living through covid there so that was outback lockdown it was it was a lot of fun just to showcase that it was a three-part special they did look at doing more but but i think everyone was over lockdown by then and we were having too much fun so <laughs> they were like, let's not show how much fun these people are having on lockdown um <laughs> But yeah, I have a few things in the works, but top secret, unfortunately. I've been in meetings all day today, so um, hopefully you'll see some more stuff coming up, but I can't tell you what it will be. That's all right. The heartbreaker right there. That hurts. <laughs> that one always hurts. I, I thought, thought we had something you. after, after this. Oh, we were friends, you yeah, know? We like, were friends. You have to do for no part two. <laughs> there you go. We're, we're not going to tell anybody, and if 
the people are watching, they're not going to tell anybody. <laughs> no one's going to know. It's except all, secret, all the viewers. You know? You know? <laughs> yeah. all, um, all six of you. Yeah. All six of <laughs> you. Maybe seven, if you, if you tell your grandma about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So bad. Sorry, I don't have bigger news. <laughs> no, yeah, okay. no, that's, that's fair. <laughs> that's but it, it, it's cool. Like, so you, you can't say what it is, but you, you got stuff going on, right? Yeah, yeah. That's that's good to see. That's good to see, especially at the moment because it's kind of like a a dry spell in terms of production and so on. Like, so you know, hopefully you you, you get a bit bit of stuff going on. Have the crack with it. Have a bit of fun. Hopefully, get to see on I'm TV. Always- always having adventures regardless of whether the tv shows them or not so um yeah there's always something going on whether it's just showing on instagram or whether the rest of the rest of the world gets to see so and would you use your youtube channel to do that as well because you know it's actually pretty big in fairness considering you don't really use it is it it's like what 759 subscribers you need a thousand to make money off us Oh, geez, no, I've not really paid much attention to that. I did um a little bit of a YouTube thing with uh, Laura Zera, who's a friend of mine. She also did Naked. We did Kai and Laura Survival. I think that's got some traction, but I just, like, I edit everything myself and um, I'm just too busy doing stuff at the moment to then film it and edit it and, uh, and put things together. But I do like all my little instructional videos that end up on insta people are always saying you know why don't you put them on youtube but then i have to like film it with the camera the other way around and <laughs> i just uh, but i i love sharing what i'm doing but you're probably more likely to find it in my insta or facebook stories than on youtube yeah mm-hmm. cool. well that's fair mm-hmm. well yeah i suppose that leads us to it like if people want to check you out where can they find you um, you can find me on Insta at Kai Frenot. Um, I am on Twitter, but I never really put anything on that. And then Facebook as well, just Kai Frenot. So that's sort of the best parts. I've got um, a website that gets updated every now and then, which is obviously Kai Um Easy first name is just KY. And then and if you are any AUX is the heart of it. Yeah, I actually spelled it wrong earlier. And I was like, oh, I put my yeah. picture. It's, it's really, really confusing with the A and the E and, and the U and the X, yeah. Yeah, you know, just Tisk. marry Tisk. someone with a short, like, easier name way back when. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Uh, so if people want to check out the Nowhere to Find You, it, it's been a pleasure. Um, you, very, very insightful. We've kind of talked about everything at this point. Um, awesome. So yeah, that, that was a good crack. So if people want to check right. out the Nowhere to Find You, thanks for getting on. Um, so Lovely chatting with you. Viewer, if you got this far, or listener even, Fair play to you. Take it handy. Good luck and bye-bye.